graphing. Anyway, um, uh, this I want to just say a little bit about the rubric under which this event is happening, and um, and tell you about some other talks that will be happening this this term, uh, and then I'll introduce Michael Hart. Um, this is brought to you by uh, 3CT and the, the module in 3CT called Worlding Writing New Critical Genres. And uh, last year we had three conferences on non-sovereignty. Um, but this year, um, uh, William Mazzarella and I especially and, um, and uh, Bernard Harcourt and um, Rob Fairbanks are curating a series. Um, the, uh, Rob and Bernard are curating um, some kind of event on uh, the uh, prison politics, um, but William and I are curating um, a series on affirmation and criticality. And we're asking a lot of questions about affirmation and criticality like does, what's the relationship between criticism and reparativity? What's, what's the relationship between critique as a mode of blockage, destruction, or separation, and critique as a kind of um, opportunity to create openings? How do we think about the kind of moralisms that get involved um, in all these directions? And uh, the segment that's mostly going to be this fall is called Love, Love Will Tear Us Apart on Critical e Theory and the Urge to Repair. And, and all, of the, um, all of the speakers who are going to come under that rubric are people who uh, have thought a lot about the idioms of love, sex, and care in relation to what theory can do. And, um, and I'll ask Michael a little bit about that after he gives his talk. Uh, the other talks for this series are um, uh, Ghassan Haj is coming to give a talk on called uh, Outside Domestications on October 30th. Uh, Melissa Gregg is coming to give a talk on criticality and care on November uh, 1st. Lee Edelman is going to give a talk on Bartleby and Occupy Wall Street on November 29th. Um, and, and CNI is coming for sort of the other thing we're doing, uh, uh, giving a talk on literary gimmicks on November 20th. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, given the uh, number of people in the room, I suspect I don't have to spend a lot of time introducing Michael Hart to you. Um, but just to, just to say that, you know, Michael's um, most, uh, uh, along with um, Empire Multitude and Commonwealth, um, Michael and uh, Antonio Negri have just produced a, a book called A Declaration, which costs 99 cents on Amazon, I think. Um, it's, a, it's a pamphlet, and one of the things that they're experimenting with is new, different kinds of writing genres in relation to critical genres and critical modalities. So um, I, and it's a, it's a really great book, and it's interesting because it's, you know, trying to figure out how to think about different ways to elaborate uh, the critical project that they've been developing for the last 15 years or something like that. Um, I wanted to say three things about Michael. Um, uh, you know, uh, Bonaventure de Sousa Santos talks about the problem of contemporary theory as, as, as a place that asks strong questions and gives weak answers. Um, and uh, that's not one of the things I would say about Michael. I w and Because if I did say, well, and Michael's a great example of that, that would be really bad. <laughs> but, um, uh, but actually, I think he has three qualities that interfere with this pattern. And since, you know, part of the project of uh, the World in Writing Workshop is to think about how people practice criticism and not just what their opinions about stuff are. I, I thought it would be worth saying something about this. Um, one thing is um, uh, that he's one of the few theorists I know who offers strong answers but offers them propositionally. And what does it mean to think about theory as propositional rather than um, realist descriptive? And that has to do with kind of always holding out the relationship between realism and imminence. Um, and one way that you could see that is in one way that you can track that is in the way that he's been developing since empire what affect means. Because in uh, one of the m great gestures of empire was to say that affective labor and affect were a really important emergent formation within uh, contemporary um, world processes. But affect was relatively under-elaborated as a concept. It was there as a force, but it didn't have a lot of referentiality with respect to it. And the last you know, number of books and also other kinds of things that Michael's been working on have been trying to elaborate this this project and process, which is to say that the, the rhetoric is, uh, you know, genuinely hypothetical. And when, it's, and when it's hypothetical, it takes a poetic form when it doesn't have institutional or um, political platforms. Um, 
So that's, that's one thing I wanted to think about, was to think about propositional theory. The second thing that I wanted to think about here was about confidence. One thing that Michael said to me once was that, uh, was that you know, people always accused him of being optimistic, but he, but he, and which to him was an insult. But, um, uh, or he thought maybe to them was an insult, actually, I think is more accurate. Um, uh, but that he wasn't optimistic, he was confident. And I thought a lot about what kind of confidence, what it means to have confidence as a theorist, and especially a propositional one. Um, and, and this has to do with, the, you know, the confidence of being near important questions, like, you know, that, uh, that criticism ought to engender new forms of life, it ought to engage in struggle, and also that it, also, it happens in real time. Like, it's not merely academic in some space that isn't engaged with the world, but understands itself to be a part of circulation itself. And I just think this is really important because if you've seen Michael talk before, if you haven't, one of the things you'll note is that he's actually thinking in real time. Like he prepared, he has stuff to say, and but at the same time, things get generated in the situation. And many of us in the humanities especially tend to kind of give a paper and then be in real time in the Q&A. But Michael actually has developed a way of being in real time in the in the talk and I think trying to figure out what it means to not only be in real time in the generation of ideas in the academy but to think of yourself as responding to things in contemporary struggle uh, is a part of the real timeness of the circulation of ideas. That seems important. And the, and the third thing I wanted to say about him is just to point out what it means f to be working with a collaborative thinker. You know, again, most of the ways that we occupy our careers is, or occupy our work is to write, write it as authors who hope that ha we have an impact by the circulation of our work. But Michael thinks with people, and not only with Negri and, he, and me, for that matter, but sort of he thinks with thought. So he's always saying, what would it be like to, to go with this idea and generate a platform from that? And um, uh, I just, I think that, uh, you know, without the kind of, and, and, he's, and he often says in his interviews that one of the great things about working in a contemporary political context is that all concepts and institutions require collective elaboration. So how do you think about the practice of criticism in relation to collective elaboration? You know, we understand that politically, but what does it mean to do it theoretically and critically? Because without it, ideas and worlds don't change. You can't change them as a sovereign. You have to change them in relation. So those are many of the reasons why I've invited Michael Hart to talk to you today. Thanks. Um, what I want to do uh, today, or, or really the, the, the point of departure is really trying to articulate the importance of the cycle of struggles in 2011 and their legacy. Um, in fact, what I, I, it seems to me that something really important happened in 2011. Wow. Is there, and, um, but is that good? Oh, could, can you hear out there? Yeah, okay. And um, it seems to me something really important happened in 2011 and that it's difficult, of course, to understand the importance of events um, in the process of their happening. And in addition to that, I felt like one year hence, you know, so um, I was thinking, I was at in, in New York for the uh, anniversary on September 17th of Occupy Wall Street and was uh, thinking about and trying to confront the different stories of its failure and of the other failure of the other movements of 2011. So, um, so I'm partly trying to think through that. What is the importance and the legacy of this cycle of struggles? Already thinking about it as a cycle of struggles is, is, is an approach to that. Um, what I mean by a cycle of struggles is, uh, and, and of the year, is to, um, is to pose the hypothesis, really, that there's uh, a strong relationship among the different encampments and occupations uh, that took place in that year, or already starting in December 2010, um, with, uh, with a small encampment in Tunis during the, during the Tunisian um, revolt. But then, of course, in Tahrir Square and in, in, in Egypt already in January, leaping in some ways to Spain with uh, May 15th encampments in, in Puerto del Sol and in the main square in Barcelona, but also others continuing then uh, in Syntagma Square in, in Greece, the occupation there. I think I'd even put together the, um, the encampments or the tents in Tel Aviv in the summer, as long as you don't call it an occupation. And then um, starting in September 17th in New York with Occupy Wall Street, I mean, I think in one sense, 
this notion of a, of a cycle of struggles is useful or, 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 or an antidote to certain um, thinking of Occupy Wall Street as the beginning, when in fact in September there was already a year at its back that, that was, um, that act in continuity with it. So partly what I want to do is talk about that continuity. But here then, here I'll pose my two problems and then I'll get started. My first problem is really about discontinuity. I think that, that one of the things to struggle with, with with contemporary social movements is their profoundly discontinuous character. And to, and to try to recognize that either as um, a failure of them or to recognize or to somehow deal with it. So I've, I, in fact, have two ways of dealing with it, you'll see. And I'll come back to this at the end, really, um, which might seem contradictory, but they both seem necessary to me. There's one which is to say, they might look discontinuous to you in time and in space, and that might be frustrating. So you see uh, in Seattle 1999, the WTO protests, or even at the various different um, summits of those years, 1999 to 2001, say from Seattle to Genoa, it might be frustrating. They seem to explode and then disappear. So there's a temporal discontinuity. And then it perhaps you could say reappears in, 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 at Wall Street 10 years later, um, or as I was saying, a kind of international spatial discontinuity, moving from Cairo to Madrid to Athens to, to Wall Street. Um, and so there, there is one response that says, okay, that looks like a discontinuity, but there's actually a subterranean continuity there. There's a hidden continuity that's either in, in uh, its principles, its forms of organization, et cetera, which I do think is true, and I often give that response. But I have a second response, um, which is that the discontinuity really is a problem, and that what and and so my second response is really a, a sort of exhortation or or even a project to try to understand how a process of constitution, even construction of institutions, as long as you understand that in a certain way, could address could create a continuity of these discontinuous movements. You see what I mean? I guess what I at least want you to see at the beginning is that I I, I do think we have to find a response to and perhaps struggle with the discontinuity of these of these movements both in both in space and in time so this so this notion then of of constitution is one i've been working with and i and perhaps insatisfactorily in the in the pamphlet that um lauren mentioned um tony and i uh work with a notion of constitution which i i'll, I'll say a little bit more about later and one of the things I found very interesting is that a friend of mine in the law school at, at, at Duke, Jedediah Purdy, who's actually a wonderful legal theorist who works in constitutional law, he said, you know, Michael, this is very fascinating and everything, but when you use the term constitution, no legal theorist would, would understand what the hell you're talking about. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I need to understand better what, what I mean by constitution and how it can function. So that's partly what I'm going to be doing today. So those are the two problems, I hope, as background. One is the discontinuity of the movements and how to understand, how to address that. And the second is this process of constitution, which, which in fact could be a one, one response to that. Okay. So I would say one way to characterize the demands and aspirations of the various encampments and occupations that began in 2011 is in terms of the right to the common. The common both as object of struggle and as form of organization. And the common as form of organization I see as having an intimate relationship to a demand for democracy or really a process of rethinking and reconstituting democracy. So that this seems to me a claim of a right. That's what I would like to pose as a basis, a claim of a right to the common. And by right here, I do, uh, I, I guess I'll take as point of departure uh, this right to the common that I see posed in these various struggles is something like the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the U.S. Declaration of Independence in the sense that it's a right grounded in struggle. That's something I'll come back to in a minute, but the, the notion of the declaration behind this is, is at least useful for me. So what I'll talk about is then, I, I first talk about the common for a few minutes, what I understand by the common and, and, and how that relates, and, and, and in particular how it can relate to these, to these movements and struggles. Then I'll talk about right a certain amount what I can mean by right, and that'll bring me back to these. I'll be able to come back that, in that way to the, to the context of these movements and, and how I can understand them. Okay, so what we mean by the common, what I mean by the common, we, whatever, yeah. There are a lot of people talking about the common these days. And so here's, here's at least, the, I think, what uh, meets with a certain amount of agreement 
among them is the first negative definition of the common. The common uh, as not property, right? neither public nor private, neither state nor market. Um, in fact, one of the challenges of all this common talk, it seems to me, is to recognize elements in the world that are neither public nor private. I think that there's a kind of assumption that all is either public or private. Um, and that, that's at least the first challenge. And so that the, in this sense, then, the notion of the common or even project for the common involves a critique of property or even a refusal of property. Property here understood as a monopoly of decision making and a means of limiting access. So property in a sense as enclosure. Now, I, and I would mean by this both private property, which functions quite clearly in terms of a monopoly of decision making and of limiting access, but also public property being that way. By public, public's a bad term here or rather, it's a confusing term because uh, what I mean by public here is rather in a rather limited way is that which is controlled and regulated by the state. Often people use the term public to refer to what I'm calling common. In other words, when you say publicize your ideas or something like that, you, you, you mean to open them to open access and, and, and collective decision making. In any case, so, so what I'm defining the common as here, this would be the positive definition of it, is the common is, in, involves these two characteristics. One is uh, shared or open access, and the second is democratic collective self-management. Um, now, the first thing then important to me about the common and this, and, this, and this notion of it is that the common is not spontaneously organized, but rather implies institution management and regularized practices. Um, in fact, I think it's the, a, 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 a problem in some discussions of the common, in my view. In fact, I've, this is rather, I mean, Tony and I have, uh, keep talking about the common. It's partly a translation question, I guess, but the common without an S. For, for some reason, the commons with an S, uh, for me, and this started with the cybernetic cyber commons discourse, it, uh, for me, it refers too much to a pre-capitalist notion of the commons, and this is what seems to me uh, problematic in certain discussions about the common, uh, in the sense that it either assumes a spontaneity of organization or it relies on um, existing social forma formations and their hierarchical organizations of non-capitalist ones. So it seems to me, in this sense, it seems to me uh, uh, useful to point out whether you call it common or commons, I think doesn't really make that much difference, um, that the common always requires an organizational project. Um, it, or, it requires an organizational project in order to construct the means for the collective self-management and the means for the, the, um, the open and shared access to it, that this is all nothing spontaneously about that. So in this sense, it, I find, um, I, I feel, I find very useful and a, a certain um, affinity with um, Eleanor Ostrom's work on, there are other things in which I differ, but on this point, it seems to me her work's very useful. And our, Eleanor Ostrom's work on the common, on the management of the common. Um, so Ostrom's book starts with a critique, um, many of you probably know this, uh, Ostrom's book starts with a critique of Garrett Hardin's um, classic tragedy of the commons argument. And more or less, uh, Hardin, uh, uh, delimit it, it describes the tragedy with the implication that without private or public property or a private or public rule even, there will be no management and hence there will be an over-exploitation of resources. You know, for him, cattle grazing is a primary example. Ostrom instead points to examples, and she's very empirical about this, she points to examples in which um, autonomously established uh, collective systems of decision making and sharing actually work better than state or private organizations. So she, for instance, one of her examples is about a fishing village in Turkey that without state regulation of, 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 of the fishing rights or private property defining the fishing rights, a uh, self-organization of the fishing community leads to not overfishing the, the um, the waters, etc. Okay, you get the idea. So what this is really then is uh, constructing a relationship of the common that involves uh, 
a kind of institution or constructed practices of yeah that allow for open access and uh, create democratic mechanisms of self-management. That's what I want. Okay. There's one thing I have to go further complicates this, or it doesn't complicate really in my view, but it, uh, it, another characteristic is that the common here thought is both, or ca it both applies to the realm of material goods and the realm of immaterial goods or even relationships. Um, and it's important to me that when we think of the common, or when I think of the common, that it, that it extends in both these realms. So what do I mean? The common as material goods, um, you could say even primarily as the earth and its ecosystems, you know, so that we were talking, uh, the examples I gave you just a minute ago about, about uh, fishing rights in the sea, about grazing in, in pastures, the sharing of the, you know, these are classic examples too, uh, the sharing of the forest, et cetera. But also thinking about the common as immaterial goods or relationships. So thinking about ideas, images, code, uh, languages, thinking of these two as common and, and hence also thinking of constructing means for uh, the sharing and open access to them and also the collective self-management of them. This, um, for me, I want to at least point out, uh, recognize, I think not probably go into here as much as it would require a conflict or at least a discord between these two notions of the common or the treatment of them. And but what I mean by like think of one the first one say as an ecological common thinking about the earth and its ecosystems is something that we want to make common and we want to share, and the second as um, immaterial commons which could include cyber commons and others, uh, and it seems to me that the one of the differences that I've found uh, worth confronting let's put it that way, is that the common in that first sense uh, has to be thought in the ter in terms of its limitation and managed in the context of scarcity. So that if we're thinking about uh, the earth as common or the seas as common or any, or the forest as common, any number of these, um, let's call them ecological commons is a kind of shorthand, one has to think about their limitation and the ways that sharing them regards that limitation. Whereas with the uh, immaterial commons, or at least immaterial in, as in a certain aspect, ideas, code, <laughs> images, languages, they function by a logic of reproducibility that doesn't have to obey that same logic of scarcity. So here's one place that I saw that, that was indicative for me where I saw the conflict uh, at, the, um, at the climate uh, summit, the UN climate summit in Copenhagen in December of 2009. One of the things that really interested me there at the event was the meeting of two streams of social movements. Um, there was, it, it, I mean, not in the climate summit, of course. In the climate summit, you had NGOs and governments, et cetera. Outside the climate co summit, though, <laughs> and in the meetings leading up to the climate summit, was uh, a stream of ecological activists, uh, often oriented towards uh, politics of climate change, and anti-capitalist movements that were, many of them grown out of the ultra-globalization movement, who were function, uh, focused primarily on these immaterial goods and the notion of the common in these immaterial sense. So I, I think that one of the wonderful things about the event was a, was a, a, a meeting of two streams of movements that didn't often uh, collaborate, but one could see differences in approach that are indicative of this potential conflict or discord that I mentioned. For instance, I saw it clearly in their, you know, in the signs during the legal, one day there was a legal march and, um, one of the best signs in the, of the ultra-globalization movement, which had been my favorite for a long time, was uh, we want everything for everyone, which is, I think, is a lovely sentiment. But for the ecological perspective, this looked like mutually assured destruction, like everything for everyone, like more stuff, more commodities, more. That's just going to, you know, it's exactly the opposite of what they want because they're focused on those limitations and the logic of scarcity. Whereas the ecological struggles, the best sign was something like, um, there is no planet B, which you know makes sense from the sense of scarcity. Like uh, there isn't another planet we can go to. In fact, this planet's already probably destroyed. But we have to struggle. You know, like there is no planet B. We have to deal with this one. But you know, from the from this anti-capitalist movement's perspective, that just sounded like Margaret Thatcher saying there is no alternative. You know, it's like because for those anti-capitalist movements, it's all about another world being possible. Whereas the ecological movements were saying no, no, another world's not possible. 
this world's probably already fucked. In fact, you know, like, but that's what you have to focus on. Okay, so you see what I mean? I guess all I'm pointing out is, I, I guess I want to give a certain kind of recognition that posing the commonality in uh, what I think is a, is a, is a common object of, of, of the struggles, which is proposing a right to the common in, uh, across these domains, there is, in some sense, different thing meant by the common, or different characteristics of the common that they're facing, and that, that, and that that's, a, uh, I think, an important um, conceptual difference and, and, and practical one to think through. But one thing I've come to realize, in some ways displacing, or at least uh, putting, making secondary, let's say, that conflict, is that what's central to the common in these movements and in that demand is not so much the object or even its qualities, like I said, its limitations or its reproducibility, but rather the mode of organization or management. Like that open access will be different for different objects, you know, say for water or for music. But what's central is the mode of democratic decision making about them and that that's what characterizes the common. Like the common thus is not only or even primarily an economic issue about property, but a political issue about democratic decision making. So that uh, contemporary social, movement, social movements are indeed oriented towards material and immaterial forms of the common. But most important and essential is their focus on the common as a form of organization. Yeah, so that rather than the water or the music here, we regard the political process itself as something we share and to which we have open access and manage collectively. That's in fact something that something like what Tony and I have have meant by the concept of multitude um, as a political project, uh, treating the political process or even a, a notion of democracy itself that um, opens to opens access and a process of sharing the construction of a collective self-management. Okay, and it, you know it might be easier to just give a brief uh, indication of uh, what I think would resonate quite easily within these movements of 2011, the various encampments and occupations. I think that the the structures of general assemblies and working groups were all experiments in making the political process common. Like that's what characterized the different encampments. One of the things that shared among all of them was this even dual structure between uh, general assembly, which uh, which tried in various ways. You know, anyone who's who's participated in any of these general assemblies know how much it failed. Like that's fine, but I don't mean. Uh, but but the experimentation with providing open access, like that anyone can speak, um, and the mechanisms for collective decision making. Uh, seem to me uh, a way of illustrating what I mean by making the political process common. Also, the other structure of the working groups or, or, or commissions, as the Spanish call them, dealing with uh, specific issues seems to me an extension of that. Uh, dealing with specific issues like, uh, in Madrid, the con commissions were on things like um, sexual violence in, in, in specific neighborhoods or problems of people who couldn't pay their rent or any number of other very specific localized territorial issues. Okay. All of these I thought could be, uh, could serve for you as a, just a quick way to understand what I would mean by the encampments as oriented towards the common in terms of making the political process itself common and of reorienting democracy in that way. Okay, one last thing I want to say about the common before moving on is a, um, political strategic um, complexity regarding the relationship between the public and the common. Um, because it seems to me that in many or even most struggles oriented towards the common, there often has to be a, a dual combat, one that is both uh, with the public against the private and against the public for the common. Like, let me give an example of what I of what I mean by that. Let me the example. Uh, I, I was thinking of giving an example in Italy. Many of the in Italy, that's what I know best. Many of the uh, many of the most active movements in Italy today are oriented towards the common in a very straightforward way. A referendum on water, for instance, um, occupation of a theater in Rome, um, an occupation of a valley in in, in, in near Turin against a high speed rail line. But it, I thought the better example, and I think it's more has more complex elements, is thinking back ten years 
in terms of the Bolivian social movements that started with, uh, started at least in some sense, with a war on water that began in 2000. This was a classic, um, so it, the, the center of it was in Cochabamba in the center of the country. Maybe many, many of you probably know that it's a classic anti-neoliberalism struggle. Uh, classic anti-neoliberalism struggle in this sense, so that what, what happened uh, was that the uh, Bolivian neoliberal government, call it like that, uh, was told by the IMF, you have to privatize the water. Why do you have to privatize the water? Because you're paying more to provide water to people than people are paying you for use of water. And so the, the government, the Bolivian government, agreed and they sold the water rights. I mean, I mean water rights, like the rights to get people water in their homes. Um, was sold to a, a conglomerate of foreign corporations led by a Frank, French corporation. And so once they were sold in 2000, what did the corporations do? They rationalized uh, the water service, meaning that they quadrupled the rates of water to make it match what they sold. It's a very logical thing from their perspective and the IMS perspective is perfectly logical, of course. So um, that gave rise to, to uh, an enormous and violent um, social movement that was oriented towards the common, but it seems to me oriented towards the common in two senses, and this is what I, one thing I wanted to get from this, which is that it's oriented towards the common as resource, you know, like water is common, and that was part of the obviousness of the struggle. Like the water is something that oblivion belongs to us, and therefore we, we, we should be able to control it. But it was also oriented towards the common in terms of its political organization and the form of community so that it related in strong ways to uh, forms of indigenous community and, um, and the uh, structure and even the democratic proposition of the movements themselves was strongly related to different forms of, you know, diff different, different forms of indigenous community. So it was in that sense, I would say both in its oriented towards the resource and its internal structure was uh, a demand for the common. So what happened, of course, after there was a similar peak of a so-called war on gas that in 2003, that was still part of the same struggle, again, about privatization of the natural gas resources. All that led to the election of Evo Morales in 2005. But this resulted not really in the making common of these resources, but in the rule of the public. And so that since Evo's election, these same movements on whose backs Evo and um, um, Alvaro Garcia Linera, the vice president, were elected, they have come into conflict with them in the sense of their, in, in, let's say, enacting the rule, the rule of the public against the common. So in the last year or two, there's been, there was sort of an emblematic conflict uh, about these same social movements, mostly indigenous movements, against a state project, a modernization project, or as they call it, a, a neo-extractivism uh, project about a um, highway going through a indigenous territory and national park. So, um, so in a way, this the movement against that was acting against the public and for the common. So in fact, what I think has developed is a kind of double combat in Bolivia and in many of these social movements, at least the ones I know in, in Latin America, a kind of double combat, which in, sometimes involves a struggle with the, prob with the public against the private, against other forms of neoliberal uh, control of the rule of private property. And then simultaneously, or in, at the same time at least, yeah, simultaneously, um, against the public and for the common against the, the government for which it was elected. Okay, so that's what I mean by this sort of double combat. So this has been the process we've seen, which I think has resonances. I, I would pose them also in these struggles around the university in the US and the UK. In any case, the, the Latin American example I'm posing is this. Progressive governments come to power on, on the backs of social movements for the commons. These governments make, they do in fact make great social changes. I wouldn't call them neoliberal governments. Social changes in terms of poverty, race relations, um, uh, against the dependency on the U.S. and its imperialist endeavors, et cetera. But that these movements have to renew their attacks against these governments that claim to represent them in the name of the common, against the public for the common. So in all this, I'm considering the right to the common as a guiding principle of a range of contemporary social movements. I hope that makes sense of what I mean by the common and, and, some, and, and even how uh, at least that's one aspect that, you, that, that, that 
it doesn't unite exactly, that, have in com that, they, that these various social movements have in common. Now I want to try, uh, it's not a really big disjunction, but it's some, somewhat different to think about what, what I mean by a right and what the concept of right, how the concept of right functions in this concept, context. Um, and I think I have to do it, um, I, I, excuse the, in some ways, low level of this first analysis. I feel like I have to separate it from certain conventional notions of right. And, and like I said, what I'm aiming at and what I think I, I find useful here is to think about the notion of right in the beginning of the Declaration. Um, in fact, two, you no know, two, I would say two propositions of right in the beginning of the Declaration. Uh, the first is really the right to equality. You know, that we are created equal, I think, is not a statement of fact, but a proposition. And then the second, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. You know, what does it mean to call that a right? So the first notion of right that I think that's different from, but it, but is I, I would consider the predominant conception of right, rests uh, on the will of the sovereign and the protection of the sovereign. Um, so that we have rights, according to this first conception, insofar as the sovereign grants them to us and guarantees them. So in that sense, we would petition the, the sovereign for rights. I mean, think of Hobbes as a classic or even extreme example of the notion that rights flow from the sovereign. Or as a less extreme example, different, very different example, but um, think also of Arendt's notion in, in um, the imperialism book when she talks about refugees and exiles are ones who are stripped of the right to have rights. That notion of human rights, too, depends on the sovereign, depends on the state, the existence of states, to one the, who, can, um, who can offer and guarantee rights. I would say this is um, somewhat of a reduction, but not, not in, in entirely different, to say that, that it has the same formal structure, notions of human rights that flow, let's say, in a Kantian rather than a Hob Hobbes tradition, uh, flow from the notion from reason that considering human rights as eternal and universal, not because um, in, in the way that they are flow from the dictates of reason. So in, in both of these regards, I certainly think that states and other sovereign structures should grant rights to citizens and non-citizens. But this notion of or conception of right, either in terms of it flowing from the sovereign or from reason, doesn't, isn't sufficient for me or doesn't, doesn't capture the notion of right that I'm asking for here to the extent that the active role is filled by the sovereign or by reason and that those to whom rights are granted are fundamentally passive. Yeah, so think about the, the Declaration again. You know, so when Jefferson's writing the Declaration, it's the Declaration does not ask the sovereign to grant these rights. Instead, these rights are claimed outside the realm of the sovereign um, and do not, I would claim, also derive from reason. That's a little bit lar longer argument. But it, in any case, it's, it's a similar structure for me that I want the, um, those who are claiming the rights to be the active creators of them. Okay, let me give a sec second standard conception of right, perhaps less standard, that's closer to what I'm talking about, but still not quite right. And, and thinking of right here now, not as flowing from the sovereign, but standing against it. In other words, think about the tradition of the right to rebellion, or the right of civil disobedience. For instance, if you want a textual thing, think of the last chapter of Locke's um, second treatise on government, from which you know many of uh, Jefferson's formulations are are derived, and what Locke says is that when the rulers betray the relationship with the ruled, then they have, then those who, the ruled have the right to dissolve the government. In fact, the, uh, the, the relationship's already dissolved by the rulers themselves by the betrayal. And of course, Jefferson does take up, you know, when he talks about the train of abuses and usurpations, that's um, posing the right to resistance because of the, of the sovereign's um, betrayal of the relationship. And I would say this is generalized in traditions of civil disobedience, thinking of the multitude as a check on the sovereign that has the right in extreme instances to overthrow the sovereign, to dissolve the government, and to, dis to establish another. And this does seem really important to me, and, and in fact is a good first, uh, first indication or first, first guideline. I mean, thinking about right as a destituent power. Like this was a term that, that, that I first read in, the, in a uh, text by a group in Argentina in 2001 writing about the rebellion in 2001 
called Colectivo Situaciones, who were, you know, a sort of intellectual activist group. And they were saying the first thing that really happened in the struggle is a destituent, destituent process, which is a made-up word, like, but it's the opposite of constituent. So when you think about constituent power or constituent assembly, no, th what they said, no, what we first did is a destituent process. And it was destituent not only with respect to the government, you know, that rebellion in that year overthrew four governments in quick succession, but also with respect to the left. Like the institutions of the left first had to be swept away. We needed a process of a decomposition, a decomposition of the, of the traditional parties, of the traditional trade unions that had to be, we had to r instead form uh, or what they argued for, you know, were unions of the unemployed. Which the, which the traditional unions wouldn't recognize. So that, that's what I mean by a destituent process, which is, I think, a first and useful notion of, of, of right. But what I want, and here I finally come to what I would mean by right or, or would like to mean by right, uh, which functions in addition to these other two, I guess, is a conception of right that is both active and autonomous. That's right. This notion of a, the right to rebellion or a destituent power is, in fact, active, of course, but it's not really autonomous. Like the right to rebellion in Locke is really dependent on, it's a kind of resistance that's dependent on the power that it's overthrowing. It's not capable of an autonomous, um, an autonomous proposition. So what would it mean to think of a right that is both active and autonomous, in which the bearers determine, the bearers of rights, determine and guarantee their own rights through struggle? You might be able to find this in Locke. I think that actually the, the, the classic reference for me is the, the uh, phrase in Spinoza in, the, in, the, in Baruch Spinoza's political treatise where he says um, that we have as much right as we have power, which is, as usual in Spinoza, a somewhat um, cryptic uh, phrase. And Nietzsche takes this up to mean, you know, that to somehow affirm the rights of the strongest in human all too human. But I think what, what, what Spinoza means instead is that um, it's through the expression of our power that we guarantee our own rights. And so this is the way I want to read even the, the declaration. So in some ways, I guess I'm posing Jefferson as an unknowing heir of Spinoza, because in fact, Jefferson didn't read Spinoza as far as I know. But, but an unknowing heir in the sense that, he's, that I see this notion of the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, also even the right to equality, as natural rights in the sense that they are, they extend as far as our strength. Uh, and that a very material notion of, mater of, of natural rights, this would be uh, precisely in their, its relationship to power. Yeah, so in this sense, rights and truths, too, are not revealed but created in the struggle. This is, fi I find this a convincing way of also reading the Declaration, you know, that the rights and truths that are proclaimed in the beginning of the Declaration are the results of struggle, and that in a way what, the, what Jefferson and the, um, is doing there is naming rights that have been won by an already existing struggle. So they're ineluctable and, and, and inalienable only because they've been won. Yeah, even, that, the, even to say that men are created equal is not a pre-existing truth uh, that is now revealed, but rather a collective desire backed by the power of struggle. That's what I was saying. Okay, so this notion of right is not, or not only a destituent power, but also a constituent power. Okay, right, so the Declaration of Rights already institutes and guides the constituent process. So let me give you a, a little bit of um, is some, is, it's really one idea that I find in, in contemporary constitutional law, U.S. constitutional law that, that, that helps me develop this. But it's again, about the, it's again about the Declaration. So there's a group of, or, or I find in a series of, of um, contemporary legal theory, theorists, um, Two of them are Mark Tushnet and Jack Balkin. The Balkins at Yale, uh, they're, they're pretty well, you know, they're well known within that thing and I assume we don't have, you're not constitutional law people here. But in any case, bo what they're both referring back to Lincoln about something very specific in Lincoln. So let me give you the, uh, the, the background on it and then see if I can make sense out of it for you. They're both reading a fragment 
that Lincoln wrote, a, a, an equally cryptic one, but it's in order to say that the Declaration of Independence is really the foundational document in US history and that the Constitution is secondary and dependent on the Declaration. So what they're reading, let me give you what they're reading in Lincoln and then I'll give, and then I'll give you the idea of what, they, um, of what they do with it and what we might do with it. So um, what Lincoln says is uh, that the Declaration is an apple of gold in a frame of silver. And so the frame of silver is the Constitution and the Declaration are apples of gold inside. So I, that sounds, I don't know what the hell that means. So uh, apparently Lincoln's, if this helps any, this doesn't actually help me much, but Lincoln is repeating or take something from Proverbs. And in Proverbs, it says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. A word fitly spoken, like apples of gold. So I don't understand Proverbs either. But what they make of it, uh, and what they want out of it, and this, and I think this easily makes sense to me and probably to you, is that um, the Declaration, yes, yeah, so this is what Balkan says. He says, the Declaration is our Constitution, small c, the Constitution that our Constitution, capital C, exists to serve. Or Tushnet says more or less the same thing. He says, we're constituted by the Declaration's principles, which are the written Constitution only imperfectly realizes, which the written Constitution only imperfectly realizes. Okay, so what, you know, here's, here's the more explanation of Lincoln and what they're trying to do with it. So Lincoln, of course, at Reconstruction, wants to say, no, it's not that the Constitution is primary and that has to be kept Im 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 immutable. It's a slaveholder's constitution. It's rather the declaration and the, and the, and the proposition of, of equality that then can guide a uh, reformation of the constitution to, to, to match to it. So that, that's what, and so then Tushnet and Balkan and other, and other of these legal theorists, constitutional theorists, can think then about the constitution not as a permanent document, but rather as, a, as an evolving one that that tries ever more perfectly, I guess, to match the, to match the, the declaration. Yeah, so the, the apples of gold in the sil frame of silver is not a good image because the apples of gold, okay, is the declaration. The frame of silver, though, for Lincoln, shouldn't be so fixed like silver doesn't move. It should be something mobile because that's what he, he wants to talk about, the mobility of the Constitution that can try to, that can try to match what, what is the true notion of the nation, which is held in the Declaration's principles. Um, now, I would say also that the, the apples of gold should be fluid, too. I mean, that the Constitution, okay, the Constitution is subordinated to the principles and rights of the Declaration, uh, but that those principles and rights are themselves dependent on struggle. Yeah, so I think it's actually closer to, even though he doesn't take this phrase from Lincoln because maybe he didn't find it, Du Bois often also talks about um, the Declaration as uh, the essence of the U.S. And, but I think that he is posing those principles of equality also continually in struggle. You see, that's how I'd read, re you know, there's a, uh, the part in Du Bois's Black Reconstruction where he's, uh, there's, a, there's a chapter on uh, general strike about, about uh, slave rebellion. Like he tries to argue, I, I don't know if it's true or whatever, but he tries to argue that it's the slaves themselves that liberated. That, that, and that, that put an end to slavery by a general strike on the plantations themselves. You know, so it's not just black soldiers fighting with the Union forces, but rather the slaves themselves that liberated. And so that, that notion for him then, it's, it's a way of being able to say that that principle of equality is something that's won by struggle. That's not just a reference to some immutable thing that was done in 1776, but rather something that, that happened in the 1860s that poses that struggle as, um, Way to go. Okay, so all of that, and so considering now, I, I get to come to the end of it. Yeah, we're good in time. I think it's right. Um, so considering these the the contemporary movements oriented by the right to the common, for me, helpfully shifts considerations on the failure or success of the movements, as well as about their future prospects. Yeah. So, so if what I'm if what I'm saying here is that you know the, I'm using the right to the common, there are probably other rights or truths that you could say the movements declare or proclaim. But, try, but thinking of these movements as uh, primarily proposing truths and, and rights or principles um, is one way of recognizing their, um, 
their success. So in this sense, how are the encampments and occupations related to the right to the common? I would say, this is in a way reviewing what I said earlier, that yes, they are oriented towards the common as shared natural and social resources. I mean, one of the interesting things about occupying the US was the large character of the different concerns that were that were brought together in the encampments. You know, that in the various encampments, ecological concerns, race concerns, concerns about the prison complex, all these things were in a way brought together. But um, I would say that what's what mostly characterizes the relationship to the common of the encampments, like I said earlier, is in terms of social organization, in terms of the organization themselves. In fact, I, I, I said earlier, I want to say a little bit more about the way that the, the notion of the common as a, as, as, a, as a principle of organization relaunches the question of democracy or puts democracy once again in question as a problem, let's say. Um, so that I, I would say that it relaunches the question of democracy not only against tyranny but also against representation. So this is one of the things that had interested me a lot in 2011 is that, uh, you know, of course that there's a discourse of democracy in Tunisia and Egypt. And that at least in part, and in most visible part, you know, that's the discourse against the, ty the, the tyrant, against the dictatorial regime. When, when uh, the encampment begins in May in 2011 in, in, in Spain, they certainly take up this notion of democracy. But of course there it's not against a dictatorial regime, it's against, in fact, a supposedly socialist government. Um, but they, they nonetheless pose democracy as central. In fact, one of the interesting things in Spain, like in the US, a lot of the activists were not what you call it, professional militants, you know, were people who were new to politics. And in fact, uh, this slogan that, 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 that was launched then in May 15th in, in Spain of uh, a primary slogan of the Kamets, which was democracia real ya, like real democracy now. To the established militants, that sounded like uh, naive. You know, like, I, I think it's, tr it's true in Spain as in the US that, that the, what, what would you say, that traditional left, even a, a established left as activists, I think the, the relationship to, to democracy, what do you say, like any good leftist, meaning like cynical, has to not be able to use the term democracy. Like democracy has been so corrupted that what does democracy mean? Democracy means, I don't know, debate among presidential candidates at the best. And then what it mostly means like is, um, you know, it mostly means outside the US when Bush, I was thinking during his different, you know, State of the Union speeches, he'd say democracy all the time. It usually meant, following US foreign policy or else they're gonna be bombs dropping. I mean, so if that's what democracy means, how could you possibly talk about it? What I like is actually the naivete that was born in the occupations in the encampments around the concept of democracy. And I think launched by the, you know, this is one of the effects of, of, of the cycle beginning in North Africa. Um, and so what did they mean by the, the, it, the, this real democracy now in Spain went along with the slogan, you don't represent us, meaning that the parties the existing political structures. This is a destituent process, I would say, that uh, it was against the notion of representation. Also, any notion of uh, leaders or spokespeople don't represent us. So it was an attack, yeah, I would say, not, on, not only on tyranny, but also against uh, the false democracy of representation. Um, and a re-questioning, maybe I should just say, and, and treating, treating the political process as a, um, through the, principle of the common, you know, that, 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 the, that, that the political process itself must be made openly accessible and, and, um, and determined by collective decision making. That that right to the common is in a way very close to the notion of the right to democracy. But democracy, I would say, yeah, profoundly rethought, which is characterized by participation um, and equal access. Okay, so um, then the failures of the, these movements were in a way defined, at least in part, by their being unable on the basis of these principles to constitute a new society. Yeah, okay, so these, uh, so I, I would say on the one hand, these, these movements certainly might continue and grow 
But what they might did most productively, this is at least one perspective on it, was to pose a new right and a new principle that could form the basis of a constituent process around the right to the common and particularly about the notion of the common in relation to political structure. And so here's where I'm, I'm, I'm divided, or at least I have two responses to the, to the question of discontinuity. Um, like on the one hand, I want to res uh, uh, respond as I did at the very beginning, but not just now, to say that what appears like a discontinuity is really a hidden continuity. This is a little bit, you know, that it's a nonlinear process and that you should be able to appreciate it as such. It's a little bit like Marx's mole metaphor. You know, so if they, in the 18th Brumaire, when Marx is looking, trying to explain revolutions in France in the, in the 19th century, he says, you know, okay, there's a great discontinuity. You know, there's, it, you see the revolutionary explosions in 1789 and 1830 and 1848 and 1870, and between you see nothing. But his, his metaphor is that it's really, when you don't see it, it's a mole that has gone underground and it's not only that it's still there, it's working. And so that when it comes back up again, it's progressed further. And so that the discontinuity is only apparent. You know, so that 1789 springs up and then it goes underground, but it's working all the time. And then 1830, it's, it's already better, you know, because that's the importance of this mole metaphor. It's subterranean and also progressing. And so you'd say the same thing then about, I think both temporally and spatially about these contemporary movements. So you'd say, in one sense, you'd say, okay, there was a flash in, 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 in Seattle in, in, in November 1999, and then it went underground. You know, and then, but then in, in September 17th in 2011, it sprang up again, but it was actually really far advanced. And the kind of organization that went on, and you know, so there's a lot happened in those 10 years. It wasn't just a discontinuity. Or the sort of spatial one, like I said at the beginning, that, that something sprang up in Tunis, and then it, it went underground, and then it springs up in Cairo, and then it goes underground and springs up. Okay, so that's the Marx mole metaphor, the saying that there's a hidden continuity that's, um, then that's the way you should treat the, it, the appearance of discontinuity. I must admit there's something bothers me about Marx's mole. It's too hardworking, you know, it's too, so I think the metaphor that I like better is something like, um, like a car speeding at night with its headlights out, you know, so that you see it appear under a street light and then it's gone. But then way down the road, you see it appear in another street light. Like one reason I like that is it gives a sense of the recklessness. Because I think there is a real recklessness. You know, it's not just a hardworking mole that's gonna get to, you know, there's something reckless about this uh, subterranean continuity of the movement said. Okay, but that's, uh, I think that that's, let's see, that I find that, that response, I give it all the time, or I think it even myself, and I love Marx's metaphor, but it's not very satisfactory. Like if you would say, you know, don't worry about the discontinuity in Egypt and whatever, they're totally fucked. You see the, the real result in Madrid. Oh, but don't worry about what failed in Madrid. You see the real continuity in New York. Like, it's not very satisfactory to say um, there's a hidden continuity and in the meantime. So the, my second response is, you might think is contradictory to the first, and maybe it is, but I, I'm, I feel comfortable with the two at the same time, which is uh, to say that from these principles, which, I see shared among the movements, at least at a certain level of abstraction, there has to be born now a constituent process that, that builds from the principles to the constitution of a social alternative. So that a continu continuity must be constructed, you know, in the same place and time. So that in the same way as the, there's been a, a, the, a, a, that there's a movement between 1776 and 1787, we need uh, the similar movement from the declaration, you know, of these principles and truths to a constituent project. Okay, my metaphor already sucks because I don't mean the same thing as the US Constitution. What I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at is the, that relationship between a constituent process, which would be open and fluid, and uh, the proposition of principles and rights on which it could be founded. Um, right, so the same way that 1787 was a slaveholder's constitution that was not adequate to the 1776, maybe 17, you know, 1865 could be better. Um, right, see these, see these rights or, 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 or principles or truths that are born in the movements as, as these apples of gold to which we must construct a silver frame. I like that thing. Okay, so um, this is what, that what, in a way I'm forced to conclude with, is that many things uh, were accomplished by the movements of 2011, but one, of the most important is to establish 
the right to the common, the right to democracy really, as a principle against which any future constituent power must be measured. And I guess even in addition to that, it seems to me necessary to imagine what and even construct what such a constituent process could look like. How can we build, here's one last way to put it, and I, sorry, I'll stop repeating myself after this, which is that like one of the great things about the movements in 2011 was they were really great at organizing a square for three months. Like so temporally and spatially within those limitations, there was really beautiful experiments which had a, a really magical character. In, a, in all the encampments, there was a really magical character of, of the possibility of a new social relation. What we didn't have though is any, any extension beyond that. And so that what we have to, that, that what I'm asking for constituent, uh, being able to imagine a constituent process is how do you move from a square to an entire social formation? And not just for three months, but for an extended period. How do you construct that continuity? And it seems to me this, this notion of constitution is what, is one way of thinking that. That's all I am. I'm not even proposing it. It just seems to me that that's, that's the uh, uh, order of the day. That's, that needs to be the agenda. Okay, thanks.